Thanks for tuning in this week's online message. We've uh, getting a little bit closer to this commission series finishing up. It's been the idea of really through the year looking at Jesus's life as an example in the life of Jesus. And then we got to Easter and it was really ransomed for a purpose. And then to look at what we've been commissioned to do as believers in Christ, really want to want to finish this up on, on really the point of being disciples and sharing Christ. And so the last two weeks we did the first and second part of sharing, sharing the gospel with all people. And today I really want to talk about sharing the gospel everywhere. And so we'll be at Acts 1 today, and, and I really want to talk about that idea of who it is we're supposed to share the gospel with and kind of breaking that down. So if you look at the word evangelize, uh, we are to evangelize. And that's really weird for some people to use, but I, I want to explain to you why it's the word evangelize and what it actually means. So if you look at the word Eve, like the E-V at the front of evangelize, it means uh, good, simply good. And you look at the word after that is angel. An angel is nothing more than a messenger. And so ultimately what we're saying here with this word is, is you're saying that it literally means good messagizing, that we are bringing good news. We are sharing what the gospel is. The gospel is what? The gospel is good news. Well, we've talked about sharing it with all people. Today we're going to talk about sharing it in all places. So Acts 1 says this. It says, In my former book, Theopolis, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he has said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. So here's the point where Jesus was resurrected. He spent 40 days with his apostles. He shared with them, and this was his final words before he was taken up to heaven for them. It is that idea that we're to share with all people in all places. And so the last few weeks we talked about, well, what does that mean, all places, when he talks about this? And it talks about Jerusalem. Jerusalem would be like our community, our town, our families, our friends, our church family, that kind of stuff. Our, our Judea, that was the hill country and the area, that would be... Um, like our surrounding towns, that would be our state, it would be things like that. It talks about Samaria. Samaria were hated people. It was a place they didn't want to go. We need to share the gospel in places in our life that we don't want to be or with people we don't necessarily want to be with as well. And it talks about all the ends of the earth. So uh, myself and a group of about seven others, uh, we leave for Kenya in, in three weeks. And so um, that will be us sharing to the ends of the earth. It'll be the furthest I've ever traveled in my life to share the gospel. And so that'll be an exciting thing. And when I get back, I'm going to kind of have a, a review of that and I'll, I'll be able to share that. But that's ultimately what we're talking about here. And I want to focus mostly on Acts 1-8 here today, uh, that specific verse, because this is a mandate that explains all the activities that the apostles are going to do throughout the whole book of Acts when you read the whole book. And in this theme, it's the theme for all of the book of Acts, because it's about the early church. It's the acts of the early church, which is why it's called that book. And they, they were to go and be witnesses. So if we're going to evangelize, our role is to go and witness, to share the goodness, the good message of Christ. It says here in Acts 1, verse 8, it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 
Well, the first thing that pops out here that I want to talk about today is this idea of this power. Like we're given a power. And it's really important for us to understand that we're given a power. So that's what I want to talk about today is this power that is given to all of us that give our life to Christ. The first thing is, is there's a promise of the power. See, God had, had been with them. Like Jesus literally walked beside them and they got to see his glory physically. We don't have that ability. We don't have that option because he doesn't walk the earth in physical form any longer. But he was ascending into heaven at this time. And when he left, he promised them to leave a power. And so that, that it would come upon them and ultimately would be within them. And that's important for us to understand, too, because the Holy Spirit was also active in the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, you read in Judges 6.34, it says the Lord came upon, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. If you read in Judges 14.6, it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson. 1 Samuel 10.10, it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon King Saul. And in 1 Samuel 16.13, it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon David. So over and over, the Spirit of the Lord came upon men but did not reside within them. But the prophet Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27, God promised, he said, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. So here it's saying that we will receive the Spirit to know the Lord and what the Lord wants in our life, to help us obey Him, to follow Him, to want to chase after Him. And Jesus promised this in John 14, 16, and 17 by saying, And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is a Spirit of truth, that the world is unable to receive Him because it does not know Him, because He remains with you and will be in you. So this is the personal relationship that has to be with, with the Lord. This is, this is why it's a personal, because the world doesn't know him. The only way you do that is he's a being. You know, he, we would know him in our life because we've surrendered our life. Jesus tells them that this is about to happen in a few days, and they were about to receive this power. So we need to try to understand what this power is, because when you give your life to Christ, you receive this very power. It's the same power. It's a divine power. That's the power of God living within us. It's the same power that raised him from the dead. It's the same power that allows us to do the things that he wants us to that we would not be able to do normally. So what do we get with this power? There's several things. The first thing we have to realize is the power is personal. What I mean by that is it comes in the person of the Holy Spirit. And this power is not something that we learn. It's not something that we earn. It's not something that you sort of grow into as you go to church. Uh, it is, in fact, not something, but rather someone. So the power comes when we have the person of the Holy Spirit, God himself, living inside of us. It comes personally to every believer who ultimately comes to the point of salvation. So when you get to that place, you have an encounter with Jesus, you give your life, surrender your life to Jesus, you become reborn, you receive the Holy Spirit, as well as the gracious gift of spiritual gift of whatever it is that you're given. So it is not a question of how much of the Holy Spirit we get, but how much of us we give to him. And so the power, in fact, is this natural result of a life surrendered to Jesus. Like it's the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit inside of each and every one of us. But the power is not just personal. The power is also spiritual. So it's important for us to know that his power enables us to impact the spiritual realm because we can impact it when we obey him in the physical realm. Acts 4.31 says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. I mean, I, I've never been a place at a place where I've prayed and the whole place shook. So I can't imagine the power that would come from that and how amazing that would be. But we must be careful not to fall into the trap that the disciples fell into because they felt like Jesus came to institute this physical impact. It's important for us to know Jesus didn't come 
to fix the world. He didn't come to fix the United States. He didn't come to fix our state. He didn't come to fix our government. He came to help us have eternity with him. He came to conquer sin and death so that we could spend all of eternity with him. He didn't come for a physical empire. He came for a spiritual kingdom. And someday that'll become physical. But for now, it's in the spiritual realm. That's where the battles are fought and won. That's where all of those things, we, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. And Jesus would have given, if we did, Jesus would have given us physical powers instead. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 and 4 says, For although we are walking in the flesh, we do not wage war in the flesh ways, since the weapons of our warfare are not flesh, but are powerful. So the power is not just personal, it's spiritual. But it's not just spiritual, it is also eternal. And so what we see in this power is it's not like batteries that we need to recharge. It's not a power that never fails. I mean, ultimately, it doesn't ever wean. It doesn't ever weaken. What it does is it grows inside of us. And the only reason it would weaken is because we're trying to do things on our own strength and not being obedient and not being in tune to what the Holy Spirit is doing in our life. That's an ultimate quenching of the Spirit in our life, not an obedience of it. And a lot of people like to sacrifice for things because it makes them feel good like they gave something up. But God honors obedience over sacrifice. The last thing that the power really jumps out in us understanding is the power is transformation. There's a difference in modification and transformation. Modification is something we force or we make ourselves do. Transformation happens out of the love of. Uh, it's a change. It's a it's something new that happens in us. And this is what happened to the apostles, and that's what happens to us when we decide to let this power dwell within us. What we see in the apostles that happens to us are three things. It transforms a boldness in them, and then it'll transform a boldness in us. Acts 4.13 says, When they observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and knew that they had been with Jesus. You won't be bold for him unless you've been with him. It's that power that rises up in a person. But it's not just a power that brings transformational boldness to us. It's a power that brings transformational passion to us. And it makes the apostles passionate and therefore would make us passionate. In Acts 5 verses 40 and 42, it says that he called in the apostles and had them flogged. They ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and release them. Then they went out from the presence of the Sanhedrin rejoicing that they were counted worthy to be dishonored on behalf of the name. Every day in the temple complex and in various homes, they continued to teach and proclaim the good news that the Messiah is Jesus the Holy Spirit in them empowered them with such a transformation it didn't matter what happened to them physically. It was all about the glory of God. And they rejoiced in the fact that they were tested and they overcame and Jesus was still the most important in their life. When we have the power of this transformational spirit inside of us, we become that passionate about Jesus. The last thing that it empowered in them and it would empower in us is the transformational ability of being affected. And a lot, of, a lot of times, like, people will try to push back on this. And I get that because we're not here in success. I said last week, we're not here to be successful. We're here to be faithful. But out of the faithfulness, that transformation did bring effectiveness. We know that in their life because in Acts 6-7 it says, So the preaching about God flourished. The number of disciples in Jerusalem multiplied greatly, and then a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Our success rests in the witnessing of it. If we never witness, we're not going to see the success of people giving their life to Jesus because we're not telling them about him and we're not offering them to be a part of it. We have to do that. We have to bring the good news to them. You know, it, it's simply taking the initiative to share Christ in your life. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, then we leave the results to God. And I tell you, if you do it enough, you will have some results. You will have some great results. But you will never have any great results if you never do. The second thing that this scripture really talks to us about in the power here in Acts 1-8 is the idea that this 
this power as a purpose. You know, the major reason the Holy Spirit has been given to us believers is so that we might join God in the expansion of his kingdom. So while the Holy Spirit does many other things in our life, like is responsible for our spiritual gift or gifts, if we have more than one, responsible for warning us, protecting us, giving us different things in life to think about, it mainly exists in this world to convict sin. And we are highly convicted if there's sin in our life through the Word of God and the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us. So this is the power that Jesus promised us. Witnessing, witnesses are people who tell people what they know. So do you tell people what you know about Christ and what he's done to you and for you in your life? We're not simply to live. We are here to speak up. We are here to be telling others of the experience that we know to be true. And so there are things that hinder our witness, that hinder our evangelism. Matter of fact, if you read Revelation 3, it talks about the idea that uh, we can become lukewarm, and God hates that. He wishes we were hot. He wishes we were cold. But because we're lukewarm, he spits us out of the mouth, the scripture talks about. Well, what that means is be all in or be all out. But don't make him look bad because we aren't all in or all out. Stop being in the middle. Stop having one foot in the world and one foot in Christ. Choose. It's what we talked about in Joshua when Joshua stood. On this day, as for me and my family, we choose to follow the Lord. You have to make a stance. You have to decide, did I commit my life or did I not? Because partial commitment is not. So we want to be fully committed. And so I want to look at the things that hinder our message, that hinder our evangelism, we're going to call them coldness. And we can develop a coldness in our love for Jesus. And what do I mean by that? You can't say that you love Jesus and be content with all people knowing some of them are going to hell. Some of them that he died for are going to hell. You cannot sit there in contentment of this situation. It should bother you. It should be something inside of you that drives you in that. You can't say that you love him and then disobey his commands. We know from scripture, Jesus himself said, if you love me, obey my commands. He commands us to be his witnesses. Are you being the witness that you are to be? And when we look at that in things, like when you truly love someone, the things that are dear to them actually become dear to you. So if we truly love him, the things that are dear to the Lord should become dear to us as well. And when our love for him grows cold, we don't any longer have this sense of urgency to share. We don't have this sense of urgency for those that we know are going to hell. And we want to be different. We want to overcome that. But that's not the only hindrance. There's a coldness in our love for our fellow man. We must not reinterpret the Holy Spirit's ministry in selfish way. What I mean by that is he did not come to simply make us comfortable. He, he came here to empower us, to enable us, to encourage us, um, to edify us, which means to build up the body. The, the gifts he gives us are for the edification, uh, the building up of the body, not just our own personal enjoyment, but with a purpose. Christianity is not about getting everything we can get. It is about doing everything we can do. So when you look at it, have you done and are you doing everything you can do? Or have you found areas of contentment that you're okay if it just plays out that way? You know, Jesus tells us that we are to love the Lord with all our heart and our neighbors as ourselves. We can't afford that coldness for our fellow man. The third coldness that I think comes out of this that hinders our, our message is a coldness of bad theology. And what I mean by this is Bad theology hinders our witness. We have to know what we're talking about. We have to know what we believe. Some don't evangelize because they don't believe it matters. If you look at universalists, universalists don't do anything because they just fit, know, they just believe that everybody's going to go to heaven. That's not true. We know that everyone must repent. All through scripture, the prophets told the people, repent, repent. Repent. Turn from your sins. We cannot be sinful people. We have to turn from our sins. We have to obey God. And if we don't, 
we have bad theology. Our theology is wrong when we begin to think that God has called us into ministry before we start to evangelize. That's not true. Scripture tells us anyone who's given their life, their responsibility is to make disciples and share with the world. God has given us this power for a purpose, and that purpose is to witness. The third thing that this scripture in Acts 1-8 really shows us about the power is the power itself in practice. And what I mean by that is the scope of our, our mission, like sharing Christ in all places, there's a gentleman by the name of Vance Harper, and he said this, the gospel is not something we come to church to hear. It is something we go from church to tell. And I don't think we understand it. Here's a story that I found that I just want to read you. And we're going to close on this here today. On December 17, 1912, a gentleman by the name of Bill Borden boarded a ship for China from Egypt. His missionary career would be among history's briefest and most effective. Borden was born into an upper-class family in Chicago's Gold Coast, heir to a fortune of real estate and milk production. His mother became a Christian, and young Bill began attending Chicago's Moody Church with her, soon becoming a Christian himself. Shortly afterward, when Pastor R.A. Torrey challenged worshipers to dedicate their lives to God's service, William quietly rose. A little fellow in a blue sailor suit, he stood a long, long time while the service went on, but there was no wavering, and it was a consecration from which he never retreated. Later, at Yale University, Bill became one of, of the well-known people as an athlete, good-looking, and worth about $50 million, and committed to Christ above all things. At a student mission conference in Nashville, he was deeply moved by a gentleman by the name of Samuel Zwemer, who was out to reach the Muslims. And following graduation, the end, he announced he was giving his immense inheritance to the cause of world missions. He joined the China Inland Mission, planning to evangelize to Muslims in China, but first came to language study in Egypt. On the eve of his departure, his widowed mother wondered if Bill had done the right thing, giving up fortune and home. In the quiet of my room that night, worn and weary and sad, I fell asleep asking myself again and again, is this, after all, worthwhile? In the morning as I woke, a still small voice was speaking in my ear, answering, God so loved the world that he gave his only witness. A month after arriving in Egypt, Borden con contracted spinal meningitis. He was dead in two weeks. But he left a final message on paper stuffed under his pillow, and it read, No reserve, no retreat, no regrets. And that rings in my ear. It makes me want to ask the question, how about you today? Are you sharing your faith? Or are there things that hinder you from doing that because you're in a heart of contentment where you rest in life? Do you have a faith to share? Are you willing to be obedient to Jesus Christ? Or are you content in disobedience of not being the witness that you've been commissioned to be? Do you have no reserve, no retreat, and no regrets if you were to die today? And my prayer for you today would be that you don't. That that would be the lesson you live in. That would be your charge. That you would have no reserve, no retreat, no regrets. Father God, we come to you here today, Lord, and Lord, we are in awe of this power that you give us. Lord, let us not waste it. Let us understand that it is personal, that it is, that it is eternal, Lord, that it is what we need that comes upon us when we give our life to you in order to enable us, to power us, to encourage us, to build us for your kingdom. And Lord, you've commissioned us to be that witness. God, let us witness. Let us witness to this world that needs you so bad. Not to just all people, but to all people in all places. Help us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for tuning in to this week's online message. 
hope to see you next time.